Okay, great. Uh, Lori Kane is here with us today. And uh, we're happy to have you here, Lori. Thank you so much for joining us for this question and answer session. So those of you, you know this already because you've watched her talk from earlier this week, but uh, Lori has done a lot in her life surrounding the game of basketball. She played for K-State. She played professionally in the WNBA and overseas. And currently Lori is the associate head coach of the Washington State University women's basketball team. So welcome, Lori. Thank you so much. Awesome to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciated your talk. So I have some questions for you submitted by the students who have seen your talk. So I will just uh, jump right into some of those. First, I have a couple of questions about your basketball career and your coaching career. Um, a couple of students had questions about the difference between playing D1 basketball and playing professionally. What was, what was that transition like? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, the most obvious answer for me and, and, you know, anyone who's probably played sports, that probably comes possible from an athlete but anyone who's played sports you know they they always hear you know well when you get to the next level you're going to have to be this this and that and and for me everyone when I was in high school always told me when I go to college the speed of the game is going to be so much faster you know you're going to the time you have to make a decision is going to be a split second compared to what you have now and you know the amount of dribbles you have before someone's going to come and steal the ball it's just everything speeds up and and i remember getting to college and thinking ah, you know i don't know how much i feel that or i don't know that that's necessarily and maybe that's the nature of my game and how i played and how i was a shooter and i mostly you know stood on the perimeter and waited for someone to create a shot for me but um, when I got to the pro game, when I got especially to the WNBA, that for me was an absolute shock, um, you know, just the speed of the game. I mean, there was no moment to jog. There was no moment, um, you know, to relax. It was like the second something happened on one end, if I wasn't in a dead sprint to get to the other end, I was behind the play. And that's, that's obviously, you know, partially because it's just a, an elite level athlete and everyone's a lot faster and stronger and bigger. And, and, you know, partially it's just, you know, when you're playing in a league with the top 120 players, not in the country, but in the world, um, it's a competitive environment and it's, it's, you know, everyone's going all out every single moment of the game. So that was probably the biggest difference for me. Um, obviously, you know, once again, just with what I said, being the top 120 players, you know, I was always the least by far athletic person on the court. And so, you know, going against players every single night that were playing my position, but were literally six inches taller and 12 inches longer and you know seven seconds faster than me uh was it was definitely a big adjustment but you know one that was just an incredible opportunity just to see that kind of that elite level of play that's great and you did you say high school in mound ridge i did yeah i played high school in mound ridge yep. yeah so that's a big change it was, it was a big difference. I was yeah. usually the best athlete on the court in the Heart of America conference, but mm -hmm. or league, whatever we called that in high school, but not mm -hmm. so much once I changed levels. Uh, speaking of your time at K-State, do you have any, uh, any good stories about uh, Nicole as a teammate? Oh my, I mean, she, she, I could really embarrass her if I wanted to. I'll tell you that because, um, you know, we actually, Nicole and I started playing basketball together when we were sophomores in high school and really didn't, we weren't, you know, she lived in Clay Center, which was two and a half hours north of, of Heston and Mount Ridge and, and um, you know, only saw each other a little bit in the summers and, and weren't, you know, the best of friends during that time. Well, when we went to K-State, we came in together as freshmen and we just really hit it off right from the start and became we, you know, we were best friends for the, for the four years that we were there. And so, um, you, you know, the number, I have a big bank that I could choose from with, with stories about, about Nicole, but probably one of my favorite was, um, you know, we, obviously most people probably know what Manhattan, Kansas is like, and it's, it's a smaller community. It's a college town. Um, everybody knew us everybody knew us just i think because of the success that we had um you know pretty pretty much right away when we started playing there and it, you know obviously what made our experience so awesome was that community and was the state of kansas and how they got behind us and how we got to play in front of sellout crowds and all that kind of stuff but when we were out and about around town 
you know, we, we were always recognized. Um, we always had people coming up to us. People just knew who we were. Well, one morning after we had gone to church, um, she and I decided to go out for breakfast um, at this restaurant called Early Edition, which is just big, like picture windows going around the restaurant. And it was winter, it was during basketball season. We were off on a Sunday. And so there, it was icy. And um, we're walking, we're walking up to, to, this, to this restaurant and literally it's just packed, it's crowded. Everyone's starting to stare at us, I think, because people are, are recognizing her especially because she's walking up her six five self walking up and um they're all starting to look and stare and she wipes out i mean like wipes out on the ice <laughs> it was the most one of the most epic falls i've probably ever seen on ice and that's probably like it's not that funny until you realize that every single person in that restaurant outside the restaurant and in the parking lot knew exactly who she was and and I just lost it. It was one of the funniest moments probably that we still talk about all the time. I love that, that's great. A question about the growth mindset idea that you talked about some in your, in your talk. How do you teach a growth mindset and how do you train yourself to be able to have a growth mindset? Man, it is one of those where, you know, teaching that and communicating that with to our team and acting like that's an important thing to us as coaches, you find out real fast after a loss, how your coach reacts to that loss. Because, you know, we've got a big responsibility in showing our players what that growth mindset, when we say we're about the process and what's most important is not did we win or lose, but what did we learn? How can we get better? Um, you know, how are we gonna grow as people because of what we just experienced, a win or a loss? And we found that, you know, uh, a, a huge challenge as a coaching staff because our immediate reaction to a win is excitement and elation and this is awesome. And our immediate reaction to a loss is usually anger and frustration and, you know, just what you do because you're in, a, you're in an environment where those things do matter. And so, you know, I think, I think it's a challenge for us coaches more than any, probably more so than our players to model what that means. And, and I think one of the best ways that, that we've found that we can model a growth mindset and, and a process, um, you know, process thinking mindset um, is, you know, mo like, like most sports teams, we play the game at seven o'clock at night. We feel what we feel after the game, whether it's excitement or whether it's, you know, disappointment. We all go home and go to bed and the next day we wake up and before we practice, we generally watch film. And that's usually a film review of that game. And I think one of the best ways that we, you know, really demonstrate and communicate to our team, this is what a growth mindset looks like, is we, we as coaches have to present that film independent of the result. So if a player missed seven box outs, for instance, in a night that we, that we won and we get up the next day, watch film and we don't show that and we don't act like, oh, uh, it, it doesn't matter. You know, we won. And then the same player misses seven box outs in a game that we lost and we go nuts in film and we show every one of them and we say, this can't happen and this, is, we're never gonna. And so how we handle that, like to me, looking at a, a game film objectively after a game is huge because that communicates to our players. Like, like if we won the game by 30, we need to get after that player for every single one of those missed box outs because that's the process. That's the, that's how do we get better? And if we lost the game by 30 and we played really well and executed great on offense, that needs to be the message in that film session. But so it's kind of, I think that growth mindset, you know, it really requires you to take the emotion out of it for sure. Um, because there is going to be emotion. Like you, you do want to enjoy a win. There's no doubt. It's, this isn't like a have a growth mindset. So if you win, you shouldn't feel any differently than if you lose. Like that's not even fun. That's like bogus, right? So it's more being able to look at things objectively and not having a different, not viewing a game with a different lens based on the result. It's like, no matter what, these are the standards, you know, this is who we want to be. These are the maybe in-game things that we want to accomplish. And if we do that, those things and lose, 
great. Like, that's awesome. And if we don't do those things and win, hey, we got to get better. And so I think that's how you like really communicate that message of, you know, we're not just about the result. We're viewing these things, win, lose, or draw. This is the way we look at this. And that, that goes for practice. That's just one example, I think, of how you sort of do that. I mean, that, that, that goes for a drill in practice. And, you know, your team might have lost, but we love to chart things and go, okay, you guys lost, but this stat was unbelievable for you guys in that game. And if you do that over and over, over again and you can re reproduce that effort in that drill you're gonna win eight times out of ten mm -hmm. or maybe not but that's what we're after and so that is a win in and of itself because you're doing the things that we're asked you know that kind of stuff so it is tricky though because I like I, I get a bad feeling every time because it's gonna happen inevitably at some point in the season every athlete that's listening to this knows your coach is gonna come in and they're gonna be mad about a loss and they're gonna lose it and they're going to say things they wish they didn't say. And they're going to have to apologize the next day and go, that's not a process mindset. That's not a growth mindset. Let's just find a way to get better today. These are the three things we got to fix immediately. And so I think that's, but, but I do think that that holding players accountable during the good times, holding players accountable when you win is almost more important than when you lose. Because they already know when they lose, they're like, oh, man, we know we didn't do this, this, and that, because the result is the proof. But when you win and you hold them accountable to those same things and say, hey, we didn't do any better in this than we did last game. We just got lucky and got, and got that win. That's, that's, I think, when they start to go, oh, okay, it's not just about the result. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have self-doubt or issues with burning out? And if so, how did you combat them? Yeah, good one. Yeah, you know, I never, I, I, for the burnout piece, I'll answer that first because I feel like that's a real quick answer for me. I, I really, I loved the game of basketball. Um, I do think, you know, even though I talked a lot about how I had goals and, and was a results-driven person, you know, I, 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 I always enjoyed, I think even though I didn't realize it, I really enjoyed that process of trying to achieve goals. And so I never really felt burnt out. I never really felt, you know, like, you know, this is something I pretty much played until my body was like, mm -mm, no more. And so, so I, I, I never really struggled with burnout. Um, Self-doubt, of course. I mean, I, I, anyone walking this earth, I think probably struggles with self-doubt at some stage. And, um, but, you know, for me, probably, you know, my confidence in my game was really, really wrapped around um, the work I put into it. So any, like probably my coping mechanism for self-doubt, like let's say I played a bad game or let's say I played two bad, two or three bad games in a row. And I'm just like, what is wrong with me? Like, where'd my shot go? Why am I turning the ball over? Like, what's the problem? And, and my response to that, you know, probably later in my career when I wasn't nearly, not, not even close to as rigid with, I'm gonna shoot this many shots a day just because I was more keeping my body right to be able to keep shooting at a high level. But when, that, when those moments happened where it was just like, I just, I'm just not confident, I'm not performing well, my coping mechanism was to get in the gym and go back to my roots and go back to what got me here. And that was, shooting and shoot in the gym by myself for hours at a time just getting my groove back and and almost I mean I can't think of a time where no matter how bad I was struggling no matter how bad personally I was struggling or our team was struggling if I went in the gym you know and just banged out a workout and and got up a ton of shots and worked on my handle and practiced all the things that I was doubting myself about I would walk out with elevated confidence Maybe not perfect confidence, but then I'd wake up and do it again the next day, next day until game day. It's like, okay, now it's time to go. And I knew I'd put in the time during that week. I knew I had done the things that I needed to do to prepare myself personally to be the best I can be. And at that stage, it's like, all right, I did what I can. After this game, I'm going to look in the mirror without any regrets and go, I know that I did what I needed to do this week. Let's go. Let the chips fall where they may. How do you keep a steady team culture throughout a whole season? Oh, 
we always, uh, you know, we, we, it's not really a joke. We talk about it all the time. Like every week, we kind of say every week that goes by um, that we don't do something to work on our culture, our culture is going down. Like it's not a culture, team culture doesn't naturally lift and go up. It's the, every time you're not working and that's across the board, you know, in probably every job and every business and every team, like when you're not working on and talking about the things that you want to be about your core values, you're slipping. It's just like, that's how it is. And so we really try with our team and, and, you know, as basketball coaches, it's not our favorite thing to do. Like we'd rather do X's and O's. We'd rather watch film. We'd rather, you know, just get some extra shots up on the court with the team or, you know, practice a little longer, but we just make a really, you know, concerted effort um, every week to do something. And it might just be a 15 minute at the end of a practice or at the beginning of a practice, pick one of our core values and let's go around the room and, how do you see this, you know, in your life right now? Or how do you not see it? Where are you struggling in this? And, and, and it's just shocking every time, like the conversations that usually get started with that and where you plan for 15 minutes, it ends up being an hour. And, and you always come away from those feeling like, you know, we grew, we grew in how we trust each other. We grew in obviously, you know, the values that we talked about. And, but yeah, I mean, I would say the, the short answer to that question is never let a week go by without working on it. And whether that's a, a big team thing and having a movie night and, you know, just hanging out with each other or whether it's a more serious one, have them over for dinner and actually like show them some clips of something we've seen lately that really hits on accountability. You know, we're just constantly looking for different ways to start conversations um, with our team about our core values and, and about what's going on with them. And, 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 um, you know, I think, and, and honestly, current events sometimes can be a wonderful, a wonderful way to get conversations going. I mean, we're, we're a program where we don't, we don't shy away from current events. So obviously, you know, even if you think about the past four months of past five months, whatever, really since since everyone kind of got isolated in COVID, we were doing team Zooms every week. And usually we had like a program plan, like here's a presentation, let's talk about this or that and show a video. But then there were some where it was just like, no, let's talk about what just happened, you know, in current events. Like, let's talk about, uh, you know, social justice. Let's talk about these things. And how, how, does, how does respect look? If we're, if, if, if we're talking about racial justice, how should we treat people? How should we speak? How should, and so it really like. You're cutting out a little bit. Oh, sorry. But I think I've got you now. So yeah. I'm good now. You're good. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, lately you, you, you kind of heard the stuff about the social justice and stuff. Yep. All of that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, so, so just lately it's, it's obviously you know, unfortunately been easy to find things to talk about with our team that really do hit on who we want to be as people and, um, you know, what it looks like to, to live out our core values when you're probably engaging in conversations that could be a little bit, you know, heated or, or, you know, just controversial. And so, so yeah, we're just constantly, I guess, looking for ways to work on our culture and, and probably, you know, the other thing is just in the day to day, you know, the rubber hits the road when you hold players accountable in practice and the way they walk in the gym and not just what they're doing on the, on, you know, during practice, whether they're, whether they're executing a drill right, but what's their body language, what's their energy, what's the vibe. And, and so it's just, it's, it's culture is hard work. I'll say that it's really hard work and you got, and it's something you got to be willing to work on all the time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, uh, I like that question. I teach business classes. So we talk about culture and business too, and that definitely resonates. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your time. I'll ask one more question that I think relates to some of what you've been saying already. Um, how do you encourage your student athletes and help them find balance between school and academic or school and athletics? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, one of probably the beautiful thing about about our level, about the Division One level, is is most players, um, you know, we 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 get to recruit kind of the 
the cream of the crop in a lot of ways. You know, we get to recruit players that and tell them during the recruiting process, look, like your life is going to be study, 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 practice, practice, study, practice, sleep. And, and that's kind of, and, and that's an exaggeration. I mean, I think we tell them that because, you know, you just want them to pr be prepared for just how disciplined they have to be with their time and how, um, you know, just on it kind of, they've got to be every single day that they wake up to make sure they're able to bring the right amount of energy to practice and the right of, uh, amount of energy to their academics. And, and, um, but, you know, I think, I think, again, it's, it's, like a broken record probably to say this, but one of the, I think one of the best ways, and I know as a former player, you know, I got to play on some teams that have amazing chemistry and that, that have a really good culture. Once again, use that word again. And when that's there, um, you know, you don't feel nearly as much like, I got to go find my friends outside of basketball and get away from these crazy people and just hang out with, get out of, you know, my team because I can't stand these people. And so I think the best way that we help our players have a balance is to give them a healthy environment to where they're like, they enjoy hanging out with each other. So practice and pre-practice and post-practice are actually kind of their funnest times of the day, you know, and then, and then they usually study together as well. And they, I think a lot of times when you do have that good chemistry, you know, they already feel um, a great balance just because they enjoy hanging out with each other and they're not having to find another time in there to go hang out with a whole nother group of friends and have another social group. And right now for us, that's awesome because we don't want them hanging out with, you know, random people. We want them in their bubble, you know, with the COVID stuff. But, but at the same time, um, you know, we've had many players that have tons of friends outside of basketball and that's awesome too and they usually find time to do that and but you know I don't know I like I'm not sure that we do a great job of trying to necessarily help them I think it's one of those things where we that's probably you know one of those things where we kind of throw them in the water and say swim you know like like figure it out you know you have class at this time you know you have a tutor you know you got to do your homework and you know you have practice after that your time is your own you know be smart about it and, and, um, you know, do what you need to do. But, um, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. We probably should think about that a little bit more. Oh, it's always, it's always going to be a question. And I think students are very well aware of that right now as classes are True. going and sports are going. Thank you so much, Lori. I really appreciate you taking the time. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, I think our students have gotten a lot out of this, this talk this week. So I really appreciate it. Great. Well, you guys are awesome. And, you know, pulling from, I'm pulling for Bethel College all the way from the state of Washington and following your sports teams. And, and uh, I hope you guys keep up the good work and have an awesome year. Awesome. Thank you again.